Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Amy Pienta, a longtime member of iAssist and also the Acquisitions Director at ICPSR. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're really excited to bring together this, um, as Linda noted, geographically spread out group of presenters to get us um, excited and prepared for the upcoming um, iAssist meeting in Montreal. Um, I assist in Cardo meeting in Montreal. And so this is um, a webinar that will give you some, some tips, some tricks, some program teasers on what to expect for um, I assist in Cardo 2018. Um, this is brought to you on behalf of the Professional Development Committee of I assist um, in hopes that, especially for people who have not been um, attending in the past, that they would um, be able to get more out of the conference once it starts. Um, so, our first presenter um, was to be Tomas. He hasn't joined us yet, so we're going to um, skip ahead. We will be starting with the program committee to give you an overview of the program. Bob Ray will talk then about the mentor program, um, especially of interest to those of you who are new at iAssist or looking to mentor some of our new attendees to iAssist. And then finally, we'll wrap up with the local arrangements committee. So, not only do we get the most out of um, uh, the conference, but we also maximize our time and experience in Montreal. Um, so skipping, uh, luckily Thomas only has a few slides, so I'm going to skip ahead and turn this over to the program committee. And I'm flipping slides, so you'll hear Mandy and, and others say, um, please advance the slide. Go ahead, Mandy. Hi everybody, this is Mandy swigert Hoba, and I'm one of the three uh, program planning co-chairs. And so we just want to give you a little bit of highlights about the program and also about our planning of the best and biggest I assist in Cardo conference ever. So next slide please. So these, the three of us are the co-chairs. So Jay Brodar from, um, who is a member of ACMLA, and he will be speaking a little bit about our partner organization in a moment. And then myself and Lawrence Horton. Um, the co-chairs, our primarily responsibilities are to come up with the theme and title of the conference, to draft the call for proposals, to finalize the program, to ensure all coordinator roles are filled, and we'll mention our coordinators in a moment. And we regularly have worked with the local arrangements committee to ensure that everything is on schedule and inform each other of potential issues. And you'll be hearing from the program, or sorry, the local arrangements committee in a moment as well. Next slide, please. So we would like to thank all of our coordinators for their work they've done thus far and forthcoming work. And we also wanted to thank the advisory folks for their advice in times of need. So these are all people who are helping us make a great program. Next slide, please. And then we also want to thank give heaps of thanks to our proposal reviewers. They are the ones who reviewed all the submissions. And even more heaps of thanks to our session sorters, which those are the people marked with asterisks on this slide, who work the magic of grouping our individual presentations into cohesive thematic sessions. Next slide. So I'll turn it over to Jay. All right, thanks, Mandy. Uh, so, so we thought it was a good idea to give everyone a, a brief introduction to the ACMLA, or the Association of Canadian Map Libraries and Archives. Uh, so to give you a very brief background, um, the association was founded in 1967 uh, and is a national representative group um, initially for, for map librarians um, and individuals working in uh, cartographic archives, but over time, uh, as the, the discipline and, and as interests have shifted, it's also included geographic and geospatial information specialists uh, working in um, the university settings, archives, uh, government agencies, uh, etc. And so the main objectives uh, of the association is to you know, encourage and support um, high standards in managing access to geographic information and to support activities that further the awareness, use, and understanding uh, of that information. So next slide, please. So this is the, the 52nd annual conference of the ACMLA, uh, and I, I've given a, a, a list of some of the common topics that are, that are commonly uh, proposed and presented in, in past conferences. 
Um, and as you can see from our, our nice map here, the conference itself has moved across the country uh, in the past. Uh, this is the sixth time that the conference has taken place in Montreal. Uh, but of note, this is the first time that Concordia University has been a co-host co for the conference. Next slide, please. So now we're going to shift to talk a little bit about the process of uh, soliciting call for proposals and, and, and give you a little rundown of the organization process uh, and, and talk about the, the sessions that we have uh, lined up for you. So the call for papers went out in late October and went on till early December and, and maybe a little bit beyond there. Uh, in total, we had uh, 193 submissions to the conference, uh, which was uh, larger than I, I think we uh, expected initially. Um, of the submissions, 11 were rejected by the program committee on the grounds of incomplete information or, or not relevant to the, the program theme. Uh, and overall, the acceptance rate was 94%. Um, Subsequently, we had 26 submissions that were withdrawn afterwards, um, but this still leaves us with a, with a very large number of sessions that we're very happy about. Uh, and given that this is the first time that iAssist uh, has co-hosted the conference with that organization, we asked submitters to, to select their organizational affiliation um, as they submitted their, their sessions. Uh, most authors identified as iAssisters uh, with around 40% claiming neither, um, with representation from ACMLA uh, as well. So at this point, I'll pass it off to Mandy, who will talk a little bit more about the, the sorting process. Sorry, I had to unmute myself again. <laughs> so um, our sorters, our session sorters use Trello, um, an online tool that worked very well for grouping approximately 115 individual presentations into the co cohesive thematic sessions. Next slide. And then we, following their lead, the program committee, used Trello to then sort the sessions they had created into blocks and attempted to have a variety of topics in any given block and to not double book any presenters, which can be very challenging, but we think we did it. So now I'll pass it over to Lawrence to talk more. Hello, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we had putting together the program. Um, first of all, when we got all the text to the submissions, there was um, the problem of um, proofreading it, basically. So we had some issues with spelling, and um, that wasn't necessarily from English as foreign language submissions, but sometimes from English submissions. But the bigger problem we had was standardizing the variations of US and UK English into um, a Canadian form. Um, we also had to spell out acronyms in a lot of cases. Um, we, we made exceptions for the obvious ones like ICPSR. It's also amazing how many variations on an organization's name could be made by people from those organizations. So I picked the example here of Gisis um, in Germany. They weren't the worst ones, but uh, it was one that was quite noticeable, um, a lot of variation there from the organization. So we had to try and standardize that. We also tried to apply a consistent style to the text as well. So terms like research data management, whether they, uh, they have capital letters or not. And the final challenge we've had um, really with the program is making sure that once accepted authors or an author is actually going to turn up to talk about their presentation. Um, almost there now, but there's been uh, a number of people, it's been surprising to us, a number of people um, are basically withdrawn from the program without informing the program committee that they were going to do that. So um, please don't do that in the future if you are accepted to a conference and you decide you can't go. Um, next slide, please. So looking at the program, um, submission types, uh, there's 157 submissions in the current program. Of these, 55% uh, are individual presentations without a paper attached to them. Of the remainder, there's 14 presentations that do include a paper. There's eight panel sessions, 28 posters, 10 pechacucha or pecacha, I still don't know which one it is after all these years, and um, 10 workshops. And uh, we had to fit those into just under four days, one day being devoted to the workshops. Um, so we have one day of workshops, three days of concurrent sessions, including the poster session, two plenary speakers, and the plenary um, Petrocuture Picacho session. In the program, there's four blocks of five sessions and three blocks of four concurrent sessions. Next slide, please. So what regions do authors represent? Uh, there's 360 
346 people listed as authors on submissions proposals. Uh, they come from 18 countries, uh, although of course residency doesn't mean that the authors hold that country's nationality. Top countries are the United States, just over half of authors come from the US. Canada has about a fifth, and then the United Kingdom, Germany and Japan. There's um, five regional groupings in ISIS that you can see there. If we group together the British, German, Finnish, Dutch, French, Swiss and Norwegian based authors, that leads to Europe overtaking Canada in terms of regional authorship representation and ISIS and Carto. Um, the most represented institution is um, ICPSR, just under 5% of authors are affiliated with them. Next highest is um, another data archive, GASIS in Germany. And the third highest, joint highest is Duke University, which is equal with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but the Bureau's 11 authors are co-authoring one paper. Next slide, please. These are the um, topic proposals that were tagged during the submissions process, and um, people could choose more than one. <coughs> Excuse me. It's no surprise that uh, the most popular ones were data management, data sharing, and repositories. And no surprise with the ACMLA tie-up this year that GIS also features highly in the topic proposals. Next slide, please. And here's a, an obligatory word cloud. This is the text of the abstracts that were accepted for the conference, so it includes the ones that subsequently were drawn. Um, it's good news that Research Data Conference features the words research and data quite heavily in the abstracts. So I'll hand you back now to Jay. Okay, and so at this point we wanted to put in a quick plug uh, for the Birds of a Feather session. And so this is run in the last few uh, ISIS programs, and it's meant to be an informal ad hoc discussion session. Uh, so we're running the same thing again this year. Uh, there's a Google Doc, uh, sorry, a Google Sheet that's linked to below in this bit.ly, shortened bit.ly link, uh, which you can follow here to take a look at the, the various sessions that have been proposed, and, and they're listed here as well. Uh, we're also going to encourage you at this point to sign up uh, for one of these sessions or propose a new session. So it, there's nothing saying that you have to have anything formalized here. This is a chance to try to bring together like-minded people or people interested in, in similar topics. Uh, so if you have anything in mind, uh, please uh, fill it out in the sheet. Next slide, please. And just to give you a, a preview of the, the excellent plenary speakers that we have lined up, um, both uh, speakers and their topics align um, incredibly well with uh, the, the program uh, and the conference theme. And so on Wednesday, May 30th, we'll have Roberto Roca, who is a digital journalist working with CBC uh, Radio in Montreal. Uh, and he's a, a digital and data journalist. And so he's going to talk uh, some of uh, some of the stories from the front lines of data science and storytelling, so aligning really well with our theme of you know, using data to support stories uh, and to tell stories. And then on Thursday, Dr. Stephanie Pine, who is a, a postdoctoral research fellow uh, at Carleton University's Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center, will uh, be speaking about her work um, with the residential school's uh, land memory mapping project. And so I'm gonna pass it back over to Mandy here. Next slide, please. And um, that kind of gives you a basic overview of our programming, uh, program planning process and some highlights of what to expect. We welcome any questions um, now or I think later if we're going to do that later in the program. But then now I will turn it over to Bob Ray to talk about the mentor program. Thank you, Mandy. I'll go to the next slide. So for perhaps a better word would be a buddy program. So what is the mentor program or buddy program? It's an effort to make it easier for new members to uh, feel comfortable at the conference, to get to know people. Um, many of us already uh, are longtime goers. And so rather than just talk to our friends that we already know, we wanna meet new people. So this is really important. So what's going to happen? The end of this week, um, there is going to be a call for volunteers. And this is going to go out to the ISIS list. But I'm also going to send to members who have uh, people who have not yet joined ISIS. So there will be um, a way to get in that way also. Um, but the URL is here. You can sign up now. You can be an early pioneer for this. It's really important 
for those people who are the longtime ISIS members to sign up. I've been doing this for a number of years and I always get many, many new people and then I end up having to um, call upon my friends to sign up. So uh, we're hoping that um, many of you that have been doing this for a while will volunteer to be mentors. It's really easy, it's fun, you meet new people, you talk, you do all the things that you normally do. So not really um, anything that you're not normally doing. Before the conference, if they have any questions about logistics, about which programs to attend, uh, what would be best for them, or are there other people that are doing uh, closer to what they're doing than just data in general, then you can answer those types of questions. Uh, next slide. So the process is uh, people will send things out. And then um, we have a very short deadline uh, to sign up by Thursday, May 17th. And then I will have assignments turned around very quickly by the end of the day, Monday, May 21st. Um, there's gonna be instructions in it. Basically what you're gonna do is if you are a mentor, you will contact your buddy before the conference, volunteer to answer any questions. And um, most of us hopefully will be at the opening reception and you can meet up there. But if by any chance, uh, one of the two of you are not able to make it to the opening reception, uh, perhaps you could agree to meet uh, over breakfast or uh, very early on Wednesday morning. Next slide. This is where the opening reception is going to be. Um, it's going to be at a museum, so not only will you get to have uh, fine food and drinks, but you'll also get to uh, see a little bit about uh, a museum uh, while meeting everyone. So next slide. Again, uh, if you can, please attend the opening reception and um, ask your mentor for advice. And the most important thing at the conference really is network, network, network. Um, this is what I love most about iAssist is that I get to meet my international counterparts. And so this is a chance to not only know the people from your own nation, but from other nations uh, that do things similar to you. And then next slide. This is my contact information, and again, you'll be getting a message shortly. So next, we are going to turn it over to one of our local hosts, Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Gano. I'm one of the co-chair of the local arrangement committee here in Montreal. So as Jay mentioned earlier, I believe it was Jay who mentioned it, but uh, we're going to have the ISS conference in Montreal for the second time. But this time around, it's going to be hosted mostly uh, in Concordia University. Uh, so Concordia University is a relatively young university located right in the center of uh, downtown Montreal. So the good thing is that you'll be uh, like just a short walk from restaurants, bars, Hotels, uh, by the way, all the suggested hotels that are on our website are really within short walking distance uh, from Concordia University. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a picture of the John Molson School of Business where most of the conference will be taking place. As you can see, it's I would say almost a brand new building. It's been built maybe five years ago. And within it, as you'll see later on, there is a conference center on the ninth floor where uh, a lot of the uh, workshop, not workshops, but presentations will occur. And that's uh, even more uh, more new. It was just built uh, in uh, back in sep September of this year. Uh, uh, not everything will happen at Concordia as part of the pre-conference workshops. Some of them will be uh, located at McGill University, which is only, I would say, 15-minute 15, 15 walk from 
Concordia. So McGill is also in uh, in downtown Montreal. But all of the rest, except for some of those uh, pre-conference workshops, will be happening at Concordia. By the way, if you have a morning workshops on uh, on Tuesday that are at McGill, we recommend that you drop by uh, at Concordia before to uh, to register or to to check in because there is not going to be a check in desk uh, at McGill located at McGill. So it's better if you have time to come uh, between eight and nine uh, to Concordia to to get your your tote bag, your your name tag, and so on, then you can either walk to Miguel or take the bus, but it's an easy walk from there. Next slide, please. So this is the D.B. Clark Auditorium, where the plenary sessions will be taking place and the Pecha Kucha and the wrap-up session, too. It's been renovated, I think, last year, so it's all in the, in the team of being new. That's another example. Uh, next slide. This is a picture from one of the rooms in the conference center. The conference center is located on the ninth floor of the uh, John Molson School of Business uh, building that I showed you earlier. So a lot of our presentations will be uh, will be located in here. Uh, since it's on the ninth floor of the building, you'll have a gorgeous view of, uh, of Montreal. Next slide. So I will uh, now pass it on to Veronica, who's going to talk about the social events. Actually, hang on just one second. We did just get a question that was relevant to where you were at. Okay. Uh, is asking, um, did you just rec what did you just recommend for the workshops? Check in the day before? Not the day before. The the, you could check in the day before. If you wanted to, there will be some hours. Uh, in the morning, I think on, on the Monday, because there we have some business meetings. So between eight and nine, uh, there would be check-in. But you can easily check in on Tuesday morning, just before going to your workshop, before making your way to, the, to your workshop. If it's located at McGill, you can, my suggestion is just to drop by uh, the John Molson School of Business uh, uh, building, where the registration desk will be located, and then just walk. Uh, to Miguel or take the bus to Miguel. But if you wish to uh, to register to check in the day before, you can come in the morning. I think also during lunch hour there will be uh, the, the there will be people at uh, the check-in desk. So it's up to you. I'm going to interject. This is Mandy, real quick, just to say that that information that Alex just shared is also on the program, on the online program. So if people need refreshers about that, they can find that there. Thank you, Mandy. You're welcome. So I think if there is no further question, I will pass it on to Veronica. Veronica, I think you're still muted. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so Brennica here from McGill, uh, co-chair with Alex. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about the social events, so the reception and the banquet. And before I do, I do want to make a pitch that we do still have space available for the reception, banquet, and the business lunch. So we do encourage you to register as soon as you can. Uh, we have limited spots uh, if you uh, plan to attend any of those events. So as, as many of you know, the actual registration is almost at capacity, but we do have uh, the registration open for the social tickets. Um, so first of all, on Tuesday, uh, 6 to 9 p.m., uh, those who are interested and registered to go to the reception will be going to the beautiful uh, part of Montreal referred to as Old Montreal or Old Port. Um, so that's, yeah, 6 to 9 on Tuesday at Musée Pointe à Calière. Um, I uh, apologize for my horrible French pronunciation. So I think uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna be deferring to Alex for the last part to talk about the various landmarks um, that you can find in old, old Montreal, which uh, there is an abundance of. But specifically to the museum, um, it is Montreal's premier uh, history and archeology span museum. And it has a number of permanent collections, which uh, you might be interested in. Uh, the most recent is called Where Montreal Began, and it was actually launched last year as part of the city's 375th uh, anniversary. Uh, 
And when I took a tour with uh, one of our colleagues uh, to the museum, when we were uh, first uh, scoping out um, a venue, uh, one really interesting feature is that the museum actually has a glass floor. And part of the glass floor overlooks, for example, the remains of uh, Fort Ville Marie, which were unearthed during the different archaeological uh, dig campaigns that were conducted um, by the museum over the, the span of about a decade. So it's quite wonderful when you walk through and you're actually walking on top of these, um, these, these uh, <clears throat> relics. Um, so part of the reception will actually include some tours. Um, there'll be uh, self-guided tours so attendees can walk uh, through the museum. And there is also an auditorium there where there will be a heritage film um, that's showing, I believe, every half hour. But for the most part, we'll, uh, you'll be in a main area, uh, which will obviously have drinks and um, delicious hors d'oeuvres. So, but while you're in Old Montreal, there's definitely, um, uh, you will definitely want to explore uh, the area surrounding the museum and I'll, I'll let Alex talk more about that. Um, if we go to the next slide, Oh, actually there's two for, uh, I guess, Pointe Calier. And that's Pointe Calier as well, my apologies. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And that's the glass floor um, in the museum. So I guess next slide. Okay, so Thursday, um, 7 to 10 p.m. is the banquet. And it will be at Lamboisie, um, which is actually in a neighborhood called St. Henry, which is actually one of the oldest neighborhoods in Montreal and it's located on the Lachine Canal, um, which used to be the industrial heart of Canada. So it's quite a historical location that we've chosen. Um, so the, rest, the restaurant is uh, actually in the heart of something called Chateau uh, Saint um, uh, Ambroisie. So that's a historical heritage building that's um, situated on the canal. And there is, a, as you can see in this picture, a large terrace that will be open. So you can enjoy the view of the canal and uh, with your favorite beverage. And I think if you go to the next slide, there should just be a picture of the uh, interior of the restaurant. So there's a, there's a glance. Um, obviously the seating arrangement will be, will be very different, but uh, that's um, the restaurant where the banquet will take place. And then finally, I'd like to um, just touch on a little bit of transportation, which I think Alex has already alluded to in a number of points, but here's just a very uh, simple Google map that shows you uh, how uh, Concordia University is, I mean, definitely in the heart of downtown, as Alex already mentioned. And since I did a screen capture from my desk, you will see the location point at McGill there. Um, so it is about a 10 minute walk for those going to the workshops that are at McGill. Um, and you'll see the closest metro to the John Molson building in the far bottom left uh, is Guy Concordia. And over to uh, sort of the center of the image, you'll see Station Peel, which is the closest metro to the McLennan building where the uh, McGill workshops will be. Um, and the GIS workshops are also at the McGill campus in the Geographic Information Center, which is uh, very close to the McLennan building uh, where, I, where I work. Um, also, in terms of transportation, I guess I just want to highlight that uh, as someone who's from Vancouver and is used to having a car, um, McGill uh, is definitely, the metro is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so you'll find it very easy to uh, maneuver through the city if you want to sightsee. Um, everything is quite compact too, uh, from what I'm used to. So if you're walking from, say, Concordia or McGill, and want to go to the plateau and go to, for example, Schwartz's um, for Montreal smoked meat. Uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a fairly short walk uh, to get to, uh, uh, for example, Saint Laurent, which is one of the main arteries in uh, in Montreal. And if you're a, a cycling enthusiast, um, there's definitely, I think, on the next slide, I might have had a screen capture for the Big C's. So there are stations for public uh, bicycles to be rented um, almost at every corner, it seems. So I think you can basically uh, ride for, you know, 30, 45 minutes for less than uh, $2 or $5 for the whole day. Um, you know, there's a Bixie station uh, by the John Wilson building and there's one actually right by McLennan. So if you wanted to bike from uh, John Wilson to the workshops at McGill, that would be a very short bike ride. Um, so definitely a very accessible city and to actually get to, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, 
to get to muse the museum in Oldport, um, I mean, I think public transit, the metro would probably be your best bet. And we'll have some maps in both the program and on the website uh, that point you in the right direction. And for St. Henry as well, uh, the metro will have maps uh, in the print program as well as on the website to guide you how to get to those venues. So I guess I'll just turn it back over to, oh, and sorry, last slide is uh, just showing you how well connected Montreal is in terms of the wonderful metro system. So the next slide uh, should be back to Alex. Hello again. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by saying a few words about uh, Montreal, uh, what you can do in Montreal, some tips and some, I would say, personal, some of my personal best in terms of what to do if you're, if you're going to be spending a few days in Montreal after or before the conference or even uh, after the conference at night if you have uh, some time. Uh, as Bernica mentioned, uh, the old Montreal area is, uh, is pretty nice, uh, Montreal being one of the oldest cities in North America. I mean, for Europeans, maybe a little bit less exciting, but uh, certainly for North Americans, it, 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 it's a nice site. Uh, and there you'll find the old port, uh, which is a lot of uh, attractions like uh, a giant Ferris wheel from which you can have a, a good view of, of the city. Uh, you can walk along uh, the water al along the St. Lawrence River. Uh, so a lot of nice restaurants and just walking in the streets, going to the uh, Place Jacques Cartier, which is a, a big square right in the center of old Montreal, where there's a lot of uh, activities and people. So that's certainly one thing you can do. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, my personal favorite things to do in Montreal is just climb uh, the little mountain at the center of the city, which is just like next or behind uh, the downtown area. It's called Mont Royal. And if you, you can walk up Mont Royal in, I would say, 45 minutes, half an hour even. Uh, and from the top of it, you'll, you'll have a, a, a very nice view. There's a Belvedere, and you'll have a view of uh, downtown Montreal. You can even spot Concordia University from there, where the conference will be taking place. You'll see it. If it's a clear day, you'll see all the way to the river and the surrounding mountains. So it's, uh, it's something that I would strongly encourage you to do. Uh, among some of the other of my favorites is actually to uh, rent one of those big C public buys that uh, that Bernica mentioned. Uh, they're fairly affordable and you can ride them everywhere in Montreal. Uh, one of my favorite uh, bicycle rides is just to go along the Lachine Canal, remember where we're going to have uh, the banquet at the place called L'Amboiserie. Uh, so you'll pass right next to that, actually, if you take that uh, that uh, biking uh, tour. Uh, so that's that's a very fun place uh, to, to, to visit. Other than that, uh, another one of my favorites is the Jean Talon Market, which is a little bit uh, outside of the downtown area, but by public transit, by metro, it takes maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most to get there. So the Jardin Market is a public farmer's market uh, that's probably uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in in Canada, and I would even venture to say in North America. It's uh, in the heart of Little Italy, so there's a lot of uh, nice Italian restaurants also in that part. But if you just want to uh, to do uh, to join the locals and do a very Montreal thing, go there during the weekend. You'll see it's packed with people buying fresh products. It's a very nice, and there's a lot of restaurants in the market itself, so you can have. Uh, good fresh food from there too. Uh, what else? Uh, of course, Montreal is pretty well known for its laid-back atmosphere. So, first of all, I'd say it's a very multicultural, multicultural city. Uh, it's the majority of people are bilingual, which means that they'll speak French and English, but you'll find people speaking tons of other languages. But uh, and anyway, all of that to say that people in Montreal certainly take time to enjoy a good meal and a, and a few a uh, few drinks so there's no shortage of restaurants uh you can email me i mean my email address doesn't appear in the slide but you can get in uh, in touch with us easily through the, uh, the the website for the conference and if you need specific suggestion i'll be happy to help you with that but there will be no shortage of restaurants and bars even around uh, concordia university 
So, uh, and also, oh yeah, it's been, uh, there's more and more terraces open in Montreal uh, at this time of the year. So it's, uh, if you want to enjoy the good weather that we usually have at the end of May, beginning of June, that's another uh, one of my uh, favorite activities. And oh yeah, there's uh, an exploding scene of microbrewery, uh, microbreweries in Montreal. So you can find a lot of those if you're a beer aficionado, you will find, I'm sure, one microbrewery that is to your taste. And this pretty much wraps up, I think, our part about uh, local things in Montreal. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so excited about um, attending the meeting and all the range of things we've heard. Um, the next um, order of business that I want to do, I'm going to zip back in slides a little bit. Um, just sorry for being out of order, but we do have Thomas who has joined us and I want to get his slides up. I'm close to being there. Um, Thomas, are you, um, do you have audio? Well, I certainly can hear you and the big question is if you can hear me. I can hear you. That's awesome. Great. Well, that's that worked out surprisingly well. Um, no Thank, you. Thank you for your flexibility. <laughs> Yes, so sorry everyone, uh, this kind of um, shows the international character of our association and time zones, even after at least half uh, doing uh, two double checks, I still uh, assume that this uh, seminar takes place a few hours later. And obviously it is still on my agenda to prepare for my talk, uh, uh, given that I assume that I'll still have a few hours to prepare. Um, but I'm happy to uh, be here and uh, happy to have a chance to have a, uh, tell a few words about ISIST, uh, the 40-year-old data uh, organization, data association. And uh, since I've missed half of it, uh, I, I guess you have uh, might have covered some of these, um, uh, what I have in mind. Uh, but I just want to sort of uh, highlight a few characteristics and a few goals uh, we have and most of these things will be manifested uh, uh, at our annual conference. Uh, now just need to find the slide deck. If you could go to my second slide uh, which actually has some colors because we have a beautiful uh, color logo and I try to do my best with a little visualization there. And my third and last slide please adding uh, some information there using that our uh, URL address uh, uh, to highlight those issues. Because uh, I assist in, uh, in three points uh, to me. It's about you and me, it's about professional development and it's about data. And uh, if we start with uh, you and me and in my picture that's the I, the individuals uh, mostly, and also uh, .org, Voluntary Association. It means it's about uh, you and me and how we can help each other out. It's as is to being a voluntary organization, we don't have any organizational memberships, we don't have central headquarters um, who would run our daily business for us and I mean we I don't have a personal assistant who would tell me when to attend a meeting. And um, but what's, what we strive at uh, is to be a community that supports those who support researchers and studi students in various settings. And uh, in our conferences you will uh, hear about uh, presentations about our work, my work, and how we can learn from our experiences. And you'll probably see this this year as well because there will be discussions and presentations on topics like setting up a data service, sur surveying our customers, uh, etc. Uh, what tools to use, how to make uh, uh, data visual, so on. So plenty of best practices, uh, what individuals use uh, at the institutions, at their work, uh, and so on. Uh, even today when it's, there is a little more guidance or instruction available on how to become a data librarian, for example, it's still not uncommon to hear uh, questions like, uh, I've been told to set up a data service, teach a DMP course, uh, 
something that you uh, yourself as a teacher or a um, uh, data archivist know rather uh, little uh, about at the time when you begin. And uh, I think that's the uh, uh, professional de development issue that I assist uh, can offer. There definitely are people who have a lot of experience on these and these people are uh, willing to share their experiences. And uh, when we look back those uh, more than 40 years and ISIS has been around, um, it's, uh, it shows that there has been and there still is a considerable amount of expertise uh, stemming from the social science background in data management, data sharing, data processing, uh, teaching with data, of data in the classroom, uh, data literacy and related issues um, like research ethics, IRB, previous A, reproducibility, etc. So there's a quite a, a strong community uh, with uh, lots of expertise uh, that is not invested through official uh, courses or through institutions, but uh, through individuals. Uh, we are a global community uh, that also adds up uh, a bit. Uh, I mean, gives gives us a little. Uh, I think Bob Ray already mentioned that having an uh, international conference, having international committee there, there means that you can uh, see the uh, best practices, uh, see how people do it in different countries, and uh, uh, take some of those lessons uh, with you when you go home. Um, I guess obviously our conference is the. Uh, biggest manifestation of, uh, of our uh, activities and international character, but it's not, uh, ISIS is not limited to that one week early uh, only. Uh, we have a lively discussion list and uh, we also have interest groups that focus on certain, certain topics and uh, these, uh, these will uh, uh, be active uh, during the year as well. Mm. And obviously the third, and I'm not going to dig too deep into research data, is that's, uh, that's the, uh, what we are enthusiastic about. Uh, but that also means that uh, coming to an ISIS conference, you don't have to be uh, a data professional already. Uh, what you, uh, you'll get most out of it if you are willing to be one, um, or if you already have something to share. Uh, but uh, as a community, we, uh, hope to be as open as possible and as supportive as possible. Um, I guess the official uh, um, goals we have is to um, advance this, uh, these research data infrastructures in social sciences and beyond. Uh, this, yeah, this year definitely uh, map librarians, uh, GIS and these issues have a very strong role and we'll also hope to provide opportunities for this collegial uh, exchange and, and professional practices. And uh, membership benefits, I should uh, say a few words of those. Uh, obviously our discussion list is the uh, one of the central ones uh, reduced uh, attendance, uh, reduced uh, registration rates for the conference and being part of the international uh, ISIS community uh, are, are the ones I, uh, I think we should be most proud of. Well, with this, I think I've at least tried to fill my uh, spot in this uh, conference. I guess we have time for questions and comments. Thomas, thank you so much um, for doing that. And um, the organizer, me, apologizes for any time snafus that, that uh, put you speaking without um, full preparation, although we couldn't tell. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, there, are, <laughs> there are a few questions written in. Um, and actually, Thomas, I think I will give you uh, the first question that came in. Um, and I encourage anyone else who's out there to type in their questions because I think I only have, I think, two at this point that we haven't covered. Um, so please type them in now so we don't log off before you get your question asked. 
Okay, so the question. The first question was, um, is there any hazing rituals for new members? There aren't any, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <your tone. laughs> uh, at least there officially uh, isn't uh, any rituals, uh, except that you are supposed to uh, uh, allow yourself being photographed after the, probably after the business lunch or something like that we love to have your uh, photo taken um, in certain years we have uh, at least allowed people to self-identify themselves uh, as first-time uh, attendees by adding a nice sticker uh, on their badge or something like that I don't know if something like that is uh, going to happen this year mm, but I, I guess that's what I uh, sort of can think of uh, uh, Okay, and uh, the next question is um, a check-in question. Um, for somebody who's attending a pre-conference session, can I check in after my pre-conference session? Well, I suppose you mean that the pre-conference session that you're attending is at McGill uh, University and you would not you would like to go there directly as opposed as uh, coming to Concordia to check in. Uh, Yes, we will let you do that. We're not expecting that people are going to try to sneak in uh, the, the pre-conference workshops without being actually registered. So yes, uh, th this is certainly uh, acceptable and you can then later on uh, come to Concordia to the John Molson School of Business uh, building and uh, you'll find the uh, registration deck um, at the, uh, on the main floor. Okay, great. Um, how many uh, people are registered for iAssist? Is the uh, next right now we're at about three seventy nine. Okay, so to all of you out there, that was I think our last question. Um, come and meet your three hundred and seventy nine new friends. <laughs> we are <laughs> um, obviously all been diligently planning and organizing and thinking through a really fantastic meeting. Um, I see no other questions, so let me end with thanking our really fantastic presenters who went out of their way to not just uh, work on putting the conference together, um, but to plan this presentation as a bit of a teaser to um, get us all ready for the meeting. Um, as Linda mentioned at the beginning, um, everyone who is a registered attendee will receive the slides and a link to the video. And of course, we will be promoting that um, the video recording as well on the iAssist um, listserv and um, and the recording itself will be on the iAssist web uh, YouTube channel in a matter of days. So once again, thank all of the presenters for, for joining us um, this midday here in the Eastern time zone and see you all in Montreal. Au revoir. <laughs>